Hopefully they're not recording from here. Okay, so, uh, okay, so um, before David starts, let me announce we are going to have a small excursion on Sunday. I'll put a sign-up sheet back here because I am still in the paper generation. I am not electronic. Uh, we will walk from uh, NCAR, which we will carry people down to NCAR, that's about several miles south of here, over Green Mountain, which is one of the parts on the ridge, uh, come outside and I'll point at it for you, and then uh, we're arranging things so you can walk back down baseline to the dorm. I'd say it's about seven or eight miles uh, total. We'll do a car shuttle up to NCAR. We will depart at 8.30 in the morning from the big parking lot to the west of Petri. I've, I've drawn a map on a piece of paper back here. Uh, drivers, please sign up so that I know we have drivers. Uh, we have a bunch of locals who are shuttling people back and forth. Uh, hikers, please sign up so we have a head count, so I have a rough idea how many people are coming. This is not binding, right? You can sleep in if you want to, and we won't, we won't come looking for you. Uh, let's see. In the Boulder Mountain Park, there is no snow. Uh, there is a very, very high probability of an afternoon thunderstorm. The weather on Sunday is supposed to be cool. That's why I'm starting at 8.30. I could start earlier, but, you know, we're all exhausted. Uh, bring lunch. Uh, I will bring two liters of water. Uh, bring rain here, okay? Uh, if you want to do something which is easier or harder, I'll put the description back there. Uh, see me. I can send you on some real killer hikes, okay? If, uh, if you think you're tough, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if you're a nice person and you want to walk for a few hours along a flat trail and smell the flowers and things like that, <laughs> no, I'm completely serious. <laughs> you can do that too, but I would like to know about it. Uh, sort of before we're driving people up there, and you, and, you know, don't come up to me at 8.35 when I'm completely dry and say, uh, I really don't want to go on a hike, I want to do something else. Uh, I will be very flighty if I'm not going to do that before, then I'll call. So I'll put stuff back here, uh, sign up, and then we'll see what we have. Okay, take it away. All right. Um, good. So... Last time we, uh, we introduced um, radial quantization. Um, and um, uh, so now I want to talk about um, something that makes it look uh, a little less weird, um, which is uh, CFT on a cylinder. So in general, when you have a conformal killing vector, um, it's often useful to uh, change your conformal frame, so do a vial rescaling of the metric so that the conformal killing vector becomes a regular killing vector, an isometry. Um, and the way to do that for uh, dilatation, so the star of our show um, uh, before was, um, was the dilatation generator. Uh, this is not an isometry of flat space, but it is a conformal isometry. Um, and the way to make this into an isometry is to uh, start with the, uh, the metric on flat space. And let's write it in polar coordinates. So this is the metric on SD minus 1. Um, and just pull out a factor of R squared. Um, and then let's define uh, r is e to the tau. So this is e to the 2 tau, d tau squared plus d omega d minus 1 squared. And this is uh, bigger. Um, sure. So e to the 2 tau, d tau squared plus uh, d omega d minus 1 squared where we've defined r is uh, e to the tau. Uh, and this is the metric on, um, on uh, s d minus 1 cross r. So what we've done is taken flat space with all these circles uh, and done a vial rescaling to turn this into the cylinder. Um, uh, the cylinder with time coordinate tau. Okay, um, 
under this uh, rescaling, the origin maps to uh, negative infinity in time. Uh, so that's, that's where the origin goes. Um, and then the pointed infinity um, uh, in flat space maps to positive infinity in, uh, in dilatation time. Um, now, under a uh, vial rescaling, the uh, correlators of a CFT transform very nicely. So, if we start with the correlator in some metric G, um, then this is equal to uh, the correlator in a new metric. Um, so, We'll have some stuff times the correlator in a new metric, uh, which is um, a rescaling of G by some possibly position-dependent factor. Um, and the only things that you get here are just contributions from uh, the rescaling of each individual operator. Um, good. So if we have a correlation function uh, in flat space, then we can get the correlation function in any space that's uh, conformally equivalent to flat space. Um, and there's actually a piece that uh, I'm not writing here, uh, which is that there can be a contribution from the conformal anomaly, the vial anomaly, Um, but uh, we're going to, uh, we're not really going to care about that very much. The vial anomaly piece um, doesn't depend on any of the actual operator insertions. Um, so it will be useful enough for our purposes to just normalize the correlators by the expectation value of the unit operator. Uh, and then the vial anomaly just cancels. Okay. So the vial anomaly is definitely interesting. It's especially interesting um, when uh, uh, if you're doing a vial rescaling that depends on the positions of the points. Um, but we're not doing that here, so it's just going to cancel out. We can just think about this as being our expectation value. Um, so uh, in the case of the cylinder, so this suggests that we should define, um, given some operator in flat space, we should define the cylinder version of the operator. So it's a function of tau and a position on uh, the d minus 1 sphere. So n is just the unit vector. We should define it as uh, e to the delta tau, O in flat space, uh, evaluated at e to the tau, say, x equals e to the tau n. Um, and uh, so correlators of these operators should look like CFT correlators on a cylinder. Um, and this is a, um, a nice exercise to check this. So compute a two-point function of cylinder operators um, and check that uh, it's invariant under tau translations. Okay, so the flat space correlators are definitely not uh, invariant under tau translations. They transform in some particular way when you rescale things. Uh, but you should magically find that if you use the flat space answer, um, 
So that's the two-point function of O flat. Uh, and you plug in uh, O cylinder, you should magically find that it has the form of something that actually makes sense on a cylinder geometry. Um, OK, so that's one thing to check. Um, another thing to check uh, is expand in large tau 2 minus tau 1. Um, so what do we expect on the cylinder geometry? Well, so if we act uh, at tau 2 with some operator O, then we started with, uh, we started with the vacuum. Uh, we act with O, and we create states in the conformal multiplet of O. So here in between, on this spatial slice, we have states with dimension delta. That's the primary. And we also can create descendant states. Um, and then we propagate up, and uh, we annihilate those states with another O, and then we just have the vacuum again. So what this suggests is that uh, when you expand in this large time difference, you should get terms that look like e to the minus tau times um, uh, delta plus n. Okay, So that's another thing that you should check for the cylinder two-point function. Um, any questions? Yes? Where did the first one come from? This thing. Yeah. Um, good question. So, uh, so the way that you generate um, a finite uh, vial, you can generate a file, finite vial transformation by exponentiating a bunch of infinitesimal vial transformations. Um, an infinitesimal vial transformation uh, is equivalent to bringing down a stress tensor, uh, specifically a trace of the stress tensor. So if we have some uh, expectation value um, in a metric g plus delta g, this is equal to an integral uh, dx delta g mu nu of x with the insertion of t mu nu. So in the particular case of a vial transformation, delta g is proportional to g. Um, so let's say that uh, delta g is equal to uh, omega of x times g. Um, so then what, we, what we're inserting here is omega of x times a trace of the stress tensor. OK? Um, now, the trace of the stress tensor is, uh, is 0 um, as an operator equation. So that means it can have contact terms uh, when it coincides with operators that are present. Um, and uh, those contact terms, um, you can figure them out by, um, so we know that uh, the dilatation operator surrounding an operator of x, uh, uh, o of x, this is i delta o, o of x, OK? Um, and uh, the dilatation operator is some integral over a surface um, of uh, x nu t mu nu. Um, uh, and if you uh, use the divergence theorem to rewrite this as an integral over the interior of the ball, you'll find that, um, uh, that the, the trace of the stress tensor is what appears, and it has to have a contact term with O that's proportional to delta. OK? So infinitesimal um, uh, uh, t mu mu's um, with O of x prime have look like this delta times a delta function of x minus x prime. Okay? And you can see by exponentiating these pieces, um, you're going to get this. Um, so the, the vial anomaly uh, is, uh, uh, is a little bit more subtle. Um, the vial anomaly has to do with contact terms um, that appear when you have multiple t mu nu insertions. So another thing that happens when you exponentiate is you um, you'll eventually, at high enough orders, you have more than one uh, t mu nu. Um, and they can have interesting contact terms, and that's what leads uh, to the vial anomaly piece. 
Other questions? So actually, this is this is kind of cool. This is a pretty non-trivial claim um, that that this thing is actually um, a cylinder two-point function. So the claim is that if you take the the icing model, the 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 icing lattice model, and you compute correlators in flat space um, at the critical point, uh, and then you do this transformation, you get some answer. Now we take the same lattice model and we put it on a completely different geometry, the cylinder. Um, put it at the critical point, compute correlators, and then you should, the answer should agree. So it's a non-trivial property of uh, a consequence of conformal invariance um, that this should happen. OK, good. So, um, so it's a good idea to think about um, radial quantization in this picture because um, a bunch of properties uh, become clear. So um, I, I was asked a few times about why, uh, why this thing is the vacuum state in radial quantization. Because usually we think to prepare the vacuum, you need an infinite amount of Euclidean uh, time evolution. This is something that we've, uh, we've used a lot. But this, this looks very finite. Um, yes? Uh, good, yeah, that, that's, that's a good point, yes. This is true for primary operators. Um, otherwise, you have to be more careful about what the contact terms are. Uh, great question. Um, in fact, I'm gonna, I'll put that on the board. And of course, you can recover the answer for descendants by taking derivatives of this formula. Other questions? Um, OK, so, so I was asked why this thing uh, should be the vacuum. It doesn't look like it has an infinite amount of Euclidean time evolution going on. And the answer is that um, actually it does. It's an infinite amount of dilatation time. So this, uh, in this picture, maps to um, uh, doing the path integral from negative infinity in dilatation time up to some fixed time. Okay, So in this picture, it's just the usual preparation of the vacuum state. Um, so there's another. Uh, uh, physical property that becomes clear um, thinking about this picture. Um, and uh, to talk about it, let's first uh, have an interlude on uh, reflection positivity. Um, and why it's equal to uh, unitarity. Uh, so, um, for many applications, we're interested actually in, in unitary uh, uh, quantum field theories in Lorentzian signature, and I've been talking about everything in Euclidean signature. So, what is the translation between these two languages? Um, so, let's assume we have a unitary theory in Lorentzian signature, um, and uh, we have an energy momentum generators, uh, H and Pi. Um, so, in Lorentzian signature, Uh, we have operators um, at some time in position x, and this is given by um, uh, e to the i h t minus i x dot p o of zero zero e to the minus i h t plus i x dot p. Um, and now, so now let's wick rotate um, and actually I'll be, I'll be interested uh, for this discussion in Hermitian operators. So O of 0, 0 is O of 0, 0 dagger. Um, so let's wick rotate to Euclidean signature and see what kind of, uh, uh, of operator we have. So let's write T. Uh, is equal to I, so I have a minus sign, I T Euclidean, minus I T Euclidean. Um, and so then we get a Euclidean operator which is uh, E to the H T Euclidean um, minus I X dot P zero zero 
e to the minus ht Euclidean plus ix dot p. Um, so notice that uh, if, if we have this, then the Lorenzian signature operators are also Hermitian. So O of Tx um, is O of Tx dagger. And this is true uh, provided that um, H and P are Hermitian operators. So you just take this expression, take the Hermitian conjugate, and this thing turns exactly into this thing. Um, but uh, something different happens once we've uh, rotated to Euclidean signature. Now if we try to evaluate uh, the conjugate of this Euclidean operator, what do we get? Um, well, OK, we have, to, uh, we have to swap the orders of these things. Um, H is Hermitian, P is Hermitian. Um, so you can check, you can convince yourself that the result is the same operator, but um, where we've flipped time, reflected time uh, through zero. So, uh, in other words, conjugation. in Euclidean signature uh, requires a reflection of time, of Euclidean time. Um, and uh, so in particular, this means that in Euclidean signature, um, whether uh, an operator uh, is Hermitian or not depends on how you quantize the theory. So uh, I've, I've emphasized before that uh, different quantizations of the theory really have different Hilbert spaces. Um, and in each Hilbert space, uh, each Hilbert, Hilbert space has its own notion of Hermitian conjugation. Okay? And these notions can, uh, um, can look different. So uh, in particular, um, uh, if you have some operator, and now let's let's say it has spin. Um, because of this reflection, uh, the conjugate of this operator also involves a reflection uh, of its spin indices. Um, and so let's let's look at an example. Um, let's look at the uh, uh, Euclidean uh, translation generators that we defined earlier. So these were p mu is minus i um, integral, and for now let's just think about um, the usual kind of quantization where I've picked some spatial slices like this and some time direction like that. So the charges are an integral of t mu 0. OK. Um, and now applying this rule, you can see that p0 has a different property under complex conjugation from pi. So p0 corresponds to having t0, 0 here, which means that when we conjugate, we get two uh, reflections in the time direction, which cancel out. And then we get a minus sign from the i up front. Okay, so p zero um, is anti-Hermitian, uh, and p i are Hermitian. Okay, so. Um, uh, so p0 is anti-Hermitian, we can write p0 is equal to i times some Hermitian operator h. Um, and then we recover uh, this formula up here. So this is, this is all completely consistent. 
you, uh, you can see that this funny type of uh, conjugation property um, is, uh, is consistent with having the usual Hermitian generators in Lorenzian signature, and vice versa. Um, this, is a, this looks a bit funny just because, um, well, uh, w we quantize this way and we find that P0 is anti-Hermitian. What if we quantize this way and now we find that Px is anti-Hermitian? Um, and that's fine, because the two different quantizations just involve completely different Hilbert spaces. They have completely different notions of, co of uh, complex conjugation, uh, of Hermitian conjugation. Uh, it's totally okay. Everything is consistent. Um, it's also good that P0 is anti-Hermitian, because that means that time translation, uh, a time evolution, which before we were writing as e to the i uh, to Euclidean P0, I guess I was calling it x0, um, this thing now, uh, this is e to the minus x0h. Um, so this thing causes suppression in Euclidean signature, which is what we expect. We expect correlations to die at longer and longer distances. Any questions? Um, no, uh, so in um, uh, this is this is a good question and it's a tricky point. So so in Euclidean signature, um, uh, if I if I quantize this way, then the Hamiltonian is bounded from below and things die off. If I quantize this way, I have a new Hamiltonian in a different Hilbert space and it's also bounded from below. So it's tricky in in the the uh, the spectrum of Px in this quantization is different from the spectrum of Px in this quantization. The spectrum of Px in this quantization uh, is, um, uh, you know, that just gives you like Fourier transforms, you know, like momenta. Um, and it, and th that can be positive or negative uh, real values. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, they're just completely different operators because they act on different Hilbert spaces. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. So R is the, is the um, uh, R mu nu is um, just minus 1, 1, 1, 1. Or, or, OK, so it's a reflection in the time direction. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I uh, uh, I understand the contradiction. Um, well, um, oh, is the Cauchy problem well defined? Um, so, uh, so I. I, I when when we're talking about quantizi quantizing with that direction being time, it's, it's, it makes sense in Euclidean signature. Okay, so in Euclidean signature, sort of all the directions look the same. So you you wouldn't want to wick rotate to Lorenzian signature and then quantize on uh, on uh, time like slices. Or maybe you would, but I I haven't thought very much about what would happen in that case. It would be an interesting thing to try to understand. Um, so yeah. Um, Okay, uh, good question. Uh, others? Okay, and y you guys are, 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 are used to this um, kind of, this notion of, uh, of, um, of time being uh, different from, the time generator being different from the space generator. I mean, uh, the, the energy um, of, in Lorenzian signature is also bounded from below, but the momentum is not. Um, so they just look completely different, and you can ask, how is that consistent with um, with the rotational invariance of the Euclidean theory? And this is this is the answer. Um, okay, so 
Good. So suppose we have some state psi that we create with a bunch of uh, Euclidean operators acting on the vacuum. Um, so the norm of this thing is then, uh, OK, so I reverse the order of these guys. And I flip the times. Um, and uh, in a sensible theory, um, norms of states should be positive or non negative. Um, and this gives a condition called reflection positivity. OK, so reflection positivity will be true in any theory where you start with a Lorentzian unitary theory. You continue to Euclidean signature, um, and then think about the correlators in Euclidean signature. Uh, they'll have this property because the states um, don't care about the uh, what kinds of uh, whether you're acting with Euclidean or Lorentzian operators. They don't care. The states always have a positive norm. Um, so uh, the cartoon for this is that whenever you have some reflection symmetric uh, configuration of operators. Um, then this has to be bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, so um, great. So uh, so I guess I've shown you how uh, if you start with a uh, a unitary theory in Lorentzian signature, then you get a reflection positive theory. In Euclidean signature, um, uh, and it turns out um, vice versa is also true. You start with a reflection positive theory in Euclidean signature, and you analytically continue it to Lorentzian signature. You get something unitary, um, and this is this is an interesting fact because um, uh, sometimes if you have an explicit microscopic description of a theory, um, it's easy to check reflection positivity. Um, an example uh, is uh, is the Ising lattice model. It's that's always always the example. Um, so you can check for yourself that um, uh, if you have some lattice like this and you insert um, some, some operator, let's say you insert the spin operator here and the spin operator um, uh, at some reflection symmetric uh, configuration, then you can check that the expectation value of these two spins can be written as a sum of squares. The idea is just to um, define the state, define a state by summing over all these spins, and then define another state by summing over all these spins, and show that this thing can be written as the the norm of those states. Um, so just check for yourself. Write out the part uh, write out the sum over spins weighted by Boltzmann factors of this configuration, um, and uh, and and check that you can write it as a as a sum of squares. Um, and so it follows that uh, in the continuum limit, um, this gives a reflection positive theory. So in particular, the icing lattice model in the continuum limit gives a theory that we can think of as the wick rotation of a unitary theory in Lorentzian signature. Um, and uh, sometimes it's interesting to think about this unitary Lorentzian uh, version of the icing model. And in fact, it shows up um, in actual physical systems. So there are two, there are two ways that you can think about this, uh, this theory. You can think about it as a classical statistical system that's reflection positive. Or you can think about it as a uh, as the wick rotation of a quantum system that's uh, unitary. Yes. For this, you would have to have a reflection symmetric uh, lattice, right? 
Um, yes, good. So um, uh, to make sense of this explicit computation, you really need your lattice to have uh, reflection symmetry. Um, if you have uh, a non-reflection symmetric lattice, then um, what can happen is reflection positivity can emerge in the continuum limit. So one thing that emerges in the continuum limit is, uh, is continuous translation symmetry, and also continuous rotation symmetry, which is a little less obvious. Um, and um, uh, so yeah, so, so reflection positivity can also be a little bit harder to check. In general, different things are, are easier or harder to check depending on what microscopic description you use for the theory. But uh, critical universality um, tells us, or we expect, that these different microscopic descriptions become the same conformal theory. And therefore, you can, you can conclude many things about the conformal theory by thinking about different microscopic realizations. Um, OK. All right, so that, that's reflection positivity. Um, now let's look at reflection positivity um, on the cylinder. So now we have a time direction. Um, and uh, we can define uh, a notion of, uh, of conjugation that takes an operator at some time tau to the same operator at minus tau. Um, and this is a perfectly good uh, notion of conjugation in the Euclidean theory. Um, and uh, in particular, we should have reflection positivity and all the, all the nice things that we want. Um, and uh, in flat space, this becomes something interesting. So you can, you can uh, check for yourself using the dictionary uh, between flat space and the cylinder that this says that O flat of e to the tau n dagger is e to the minus 2 delta tau O flat of e to the minus tau n. Um, and just to write it again, O flat of x dagger is x to the minus 2 delta O flat of x over x squared. And this is an inversion. Which makes sense. Um, the time flip on the cylinder uh, swaps um, uh, negative infinity and positive infinity. So it swaps the origin and infinity in flat space. Uh, and that's what our inversion transformation was. Um, and uh, so this is conjugation in uh, radial quantization. And just to belabor the point, if you were thinking in a different kind of, of quantization, like the usual quantization, you would just have a completely different formula for what the, what the Hermitian conjugate of the operator would be. Um, OK, so inversion is the thing that does the time reflection for us. Um, and this means that the conjugates of our conformal generators um, in radio quantization uh, are given by conjugating their killing vectors with an inversion. So uh, check for yourself that this means that uh, mu nu uh, is Hermitian, which makes sense because if you rotate and invert, it's the same as inverting and rotating the same way. Inversion does nothing. Uh, more interestingly, uh, D is anti-Hermitian because inversion swi switches the direction of dilatation time. Uh, and P mu uh, gets conjugated to K mu. 
P mu is a translation around the origin. K mu is a translation around infinity. Uh, so we have these funny uh, conjugation properties of the conformal generators in radial quantization. This one in particular, note that uh, this says that D is anti-Hermitian. So its eigenvalues are I times some real number, uh, which is something that uh, I've been claiming, uh, I claimed a bunch of times on physical grounds. Um, but here you can see why it's true. It's true in um, a reflection positive theory. OK, so now, now we can have a lot of fun. Um, we can do stuff like uh, computing correlators just using the algebra. And this is a nice computation just to give you um, a feel for uh, how these sorts of things work. So let's consider a two-point function uh, of operators. We'll take them to be scalars for simplicity. So, and I'll assume that uh, that y is farther from the origin than x, so that in radial quantization this becomes o of y o of x, standard speech in the vacuum. Um, now, uh, what is this thing? Well, we can write it as um, uh, as the conjugate of something. Um, okay, so here I'm just using this formula uh, for conjugation um, backwards. Okay. Um, but uh, what is this? Well, O at this inverted position uh, is given by uh, translating with our translation generators. Um, let me just write this as O. The state O. Uh, and now we can use our rules for um, uh, complex conjugating the conformal generators, uh, which say that this is equal to the conjugate state uh, e to the plus i k dot y over y squared. All right, so now uh, we have an expression for our, our, our uh, two-point function, y to the minus 2 delta, o e to the i k dot y over y squared, e to the minus i p dot x, o. And we can evaluate this using the conformal algebra. So uh, as a, um, uh, just for simplicity, Let's expand this thing um, to first order. So we have 1 plus a term with k plus a term with p plus a term that I'll, I'll write um, more explicitly with both of them, y mu over y squared, x nu, k mu, p nu, plus dot, dot, dot.
So uh, what happens to this term? Right, right. So O is primary, so this thing just kills O. What about this term? Same. Why, why the same? Right, because it goes that way. OK, good. Um, uh, all right, so the interesting term is, uh, is the first one and the last one. Um, so for, for, uh, for this one, you, you guys, I'm sure, can see how this is going to go. We have to evaluate this. Um, but O is primary, so we can replace this product with a commutator. Um, and now use the conformal algebra to replace this commutator uh, with um, minus 2i d delta mu nu minus m mu nu. Um, uh, we're considering scalars uh, for simplicity. So this is just equal to 2 delta. All right. So the result is that um, we get uh, y to the minus 2 delta, the norm of this state, times 1 plus 2 delta x dot y over y squared plus dot dot dot. Um, and so you should check uh, that this agrees with the usual formula. Uh, when we expand it um, in uh, small x over y. And so now you can imagine um, doing the same thing for all the terms. Uh, and you should magically find that if you do, uh, do this exercise a billion times, it gets infinitely harder and harder. Um, and resum everything, you should just get the two-point function. So this is another way of understanding um, why the two-point function is fixed by conformal invariance. Questions? Oh, um, good. So the commutator is, uh, is kp minus pk. But the pk term is 0, because k acts on o to give 0. Other questions? So if you really, really like that computation, you can do the same thing for a three-point function and show why it is also fixed by the conformal algebra. Um, but probably a simpler, a simpler exercise that you guys uh, should also try. So we can consider, let's say, different operators and look at uh, the dilatation generator or the rotation generator sandwiched between them. Um, and in this case, let's, let's allow the operators to be, uh, to have spin. Okay. Um, so show that by evaluating these correlators in two different ways, acting first to the right and then to the left, you should be able to derive that, um, uh, Delta 1 equals delta 2 um, uh, if, well, um, yeah, derive that O1, O2 is non zero if delta 1 equals delta 2 can be non zero if delta 1 equals delta 2. Actually, maybe a better way to say it is O1. O2 is zero if delta one and delta two are not equal. Okay, so this was a this is something we derived earlier, but here you can show it using the algebra. Um, and using this, uh, you can show that um, uh, the same thing. Um, if the spins are different, then this has to vanish. And if you have identical operators, um, then this has to be proportional to 
um, uh, to the identity matrix for irreducible representations. So those are just some quick things you can check. Uh, good. OK, so the other thing we can get a lot of mileage out of um, is reflection positivity itself. Um, and this leads to some constraints called unitarity bounds, because reflection positivity and unitarity are the same thing. Um, so. Uh, Let's um, uh, let's think about an operator with spin. Um, and I'll define its uh, its conjugate state um, with a lowered index. Um, this is just, just a convention. So the reason for the lowered index is because um, uh, complex conjugation will swap uh, uh, dual representations of, uh, of SOD. This is totally unimportant. You can ignore the raising and lowering of these, uh, of these indices. Um, OK, so good. So reflection positivity says that norms of states have to be positive. So one thing we should demand is that um, uh, the norm of um, uh, the norm of this thing be positive. And so that means that this coefficient here um, is some positive number. All right? But um, we should also have that norms of descendant states are positive. So in particular, you can take a look at uh, the first descendant of this guy um, and take its norm. Uh, and um, uh, we can think of this as a matrix of norms for all the possible uh, states. And, the, and uh, reflection positivity says that this matrix, where we think of it as being indexed by nu b and mu a, has to be positive semi-definite. Um, OK, so uh, you can evaluate this using the conformal algebra. And you should find that it's equal to 2 delta, delta mu nu, delta AB plus 2i s mu nu uh, AB, where remember these were the uh, finite dimension, uh, these were the SOD generators in the finite dimensional representation associated to O. Um, and the claim is that this thing has to be a positive semi-definite matrix. So this, that's what this funny greater than or equal to sign says, um, which in particular means that uh, delta has to be larger than um, the largest eigenvalue of minus this. So delta is bigger than or equal to max eigenvalue of minus 2i s mu nu. A, B, um, where you should think of, again, you should think of this thing as being a matrix um, acting on the tensor product of the vector representation um, with the representation associated to O. Um, and I'm going to skip the calculation of what this is uh, unless, unless people want me to do it. And just write what the answer is. You can already see in the case of scalars, um, in the case of scalars, this gives uh, delta is bigger than or equal to 0. Okay? So we've derived the thing that I claimed uh, earlier, that the dimensions um, should be bounded from below by 0. Before, I was demanding it from cluster decomposition, but here we just derive it from reflection positivity. 
Uh, so in general, the answer is that delta is bigger than or equal to 0 if L equals 0, um, and uh, L plus D minus 2 if L is bigger than 0. OK, so that was just from considering um, this matrix of norms. Um, but you could also look at higher descendant states. Um, and uh, the interesting one, which is left as an exercise, is to look at p squared o um, and show that demanding that its norm be positive implies that delta is bigger than or equal to d minus 2 over 2. Uh, or, actually, for delta equals 0. It's also allowed. OK, so the summary is that delta is equal to 0, or delta is bigger than or equal to d minus 2 over 2 for l equals 0, l plus d minus 2 for l bigger than 0. And we got this just by checking a few uh, descendant states. Um, in general, you have to check positivity of all the descendant states. Um, but it turns out that um, positivity of all the descendant states will follow uh, from these conditions. So you get no new conditions. Yes? So delta equals 0 is the identity operator. Presumably something horrible goes wrong if you try to have more than one set state in your theory. More than one identity operator. More than um, one delta equals 0. Well, OK, so, so the delta equals 0 states, uh, you will be able to show using the conformal algebra um, that their correlation functions are completely fixed um, to agree with the correlation functions of the identity operator. So um, it's not uh, um, uh, yeah so actually I think probably what you could have is um, super selection sectors um, where you just have two completely decoupled CFTs and you think about one state as being the... Actually, no, I don't think you can. I, I, I don't think you can. The ground state of the whole theory will be just the tensor product of the ground states of the two. Um, yeah, I think it's, it just doesn't make sense to talk about two operators because their correlators are all exactly equivalent. Yes? Oh yeah, that that absolutely makes sense. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, uh, I'm just I'm just claiming it here without proof, but it, it turns out to be true. Um, I, uh, if you have more structure in your theory, you can get more information. So, um, for example, uh, in two dimensions, the algebra we've been talking about is a subalgebra of the full symmetry algebra of the theory. And then by considering the full symmetry algebra, you can derive even more constraints. Um, another example is in a superconformal theory, the conformal algebra we've been talking about is a subalgebra of the superconformal algebra. Um, and by considering superconformal descendants, you can derive more constraints. Yes? Pardon? Um, yes, uh, there are similar unitarity bounds. Um, uh, I'm not sure if the, I don't I don't think they're derived in exactly this way um, because uh, you don't have um, uh, you don't have this inversion uh, property to use. Although I'm I'm not completely certain about that. But um, uh, one way to derive unitarity bounds in scale invariant theories is to consider 
say, two-point functions of operators in flat space um, and simply demand that they have a, a good um, uh, cowan lehman spectral decomposition. Um, and so that, that will give you... Um, that will give you some some kind of constraint. I think I think you get something like delta is greater than or equal to zero or something in those theories, but I'm not totally certain. Other questions? Uh, no, the correlation functions don't have to be the same. So so that that claim that I made about delta equals zero operators all having the same correlation functions is something very special to delta equals zero operators. Basically, the word identities for delta equals zero operators will be much, much stronger than the word identities for all other operators. So, yeah, in general, your theory can have, um, uh, it, it should have um, a unique uh, identity operator, a unique unit operator, um, and uh, um, uh, if, it's, if it's not two decoupled theories, it should have a unique stress tensor. Um, but other than that, you can have as many operators as you want. They can coincide in dimension and spin and, and so on. And their correlators will be different. The correlators are determined by OPE coefficients, which we'll define in a moment. Yes? Um, that's, yeah, the, that's, it's true, it, it's, it's certainly true in two and four dimensions, um, and in three dimensions it's probably true for most theories outside of pathological cases, um, but yes, let's say that it's true. Okay, um, that's right, um, yeah, I mean, if, you're, if your scale invariant theory is also conformal, then you can just apply these bounds. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, uh, S dagger S equals one. That that's that's sort of like um, uh, that that's basically just saying that time evolution is unitary is given by some unitary operator. So that's that's the that's equivalent to these the statement about how. The Lorenzian generators are Hermitian, um, so that when you exponentiate them, you get unitary operators. Um, so we're, we're assuming that. That's the, I, I guess unitarity has two pieces. One of them is that that the, that um, uh, uh, symmetries act with unitary operators on the Hilbert space, um, and the other is that norms of states should be positive. Ah, um, good question. Um, so, yeah, exactly. So the question was, what about a gauge field which has scaling dimension one? Um, and the the answer is that a gauge field um, is not uh, is not a local operator. Um, it's because it's not gauge invariant. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it, that's a that's that that's a good point. Also, yeah, I mean, it. Uh, um, well, the operator transforms simply under Lorentz transformations. Um. Right. Right. Good. So you're using the expression for the gauge field in terms of the particles that you know it describes. Yes, that's true. Good. So yeah, we're always talking about physical uh, physical observables, which means gauge invariant operators. Uh, was there another question? I thought there was. Okay. Um, good. So, so what happens? Um, 
What happens if these bounds are saturated? So this is true. Uh, so the bounds are coming from demanding that certain descendants have positive norm. So that means that uh, when the bounds are saturated, there's some descendant uh, whose norm is going to zero. So there's some null descendant. Um, so as an example, uh, when this bound is saturated um, for a scalar operator, it means that this state is actually 0. So for a scalar, delta is d minus 2 over 2 implies that p squared o equals 0. And in operator language, this says that del squared o of x is 0. And so this means that the scalar is free. It satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation, and it satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation inside any correlation function. So its correlators will be those of a free scalar, um, and it just decouples from the rest of the CFT and is completely uninteresting. Well, if you're interested in free scalars, it's interesting. Um, OK, so that's, that's this first bound. Um, right. If this one is saturated, then then that's the unit operator. Um, and then the other interesting one is this one. Um, and it turns out that the null descendant in that case, so spin L delta equals uh, L plus d minus 2 implies that the following descendant is null. So this is p acting on O, where we contract the index of p with the index of O. And the way to get this is to dig into the computation that I skipped of the maximum eigenvalue of that matrix. Um, you'll find that, that this thing has to have norm 0 um, when this is true. Uh, and in operator language, this says that d mu o mu mu2 through mu l of x is 0, and this is a conserved current. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there you'd have to redo this computation, um, and uh, then you would get some other some other bound there. But that you can absolutely it's do. Not just this formula. Yeah, it's not just this formula. Yeah. So that that's a uh, thank you for for asking that. So uh, in general, you can have operators in any representation of SOD. So in three dimensions, um, fermionic representations and and uh, spin L representations are all there is because. Um, the rotation group is SO3, but in higher dimensions you can have all sorts of interesting things, and they'll have their own interesting uh, unitarity bounds. Um, so let me just mention two important examples uh, of conserved currents. One of them is um, uh, T mu nu, the stress tensor, um, and um, it has spin 2, uh, and if it's conserved, it must have dimension um, 2 plus d minus 2. OK, so this, uh, this is an if and only if. The statement that it's conserved is the statement that it has an all descendant. And this implies that the unitarity bound must be saturated in this case. Um, so this is L equals 2, delta equals d. And another example is uh, a global symmetry current which has L equals 1, delta is d minus 1. It is. So um, no, uh, it, it's, it is a primary operator um, with respect to the global conformal group. Um, so uh, 
if you have the full Virasoro algebra, you can redefine what you mean by primary. So usually primary means the operator with lowest dimension in the entire multiplet. So when you have a larger algebra, you have a bigger multiplet. You can go farther down so in that's, dimension. That's a 2D thing. It's a 2D thing. Center, yeah. That's right, yeah. So in 2D, the language would be that the stress sensor is a quasi-primary. Um, and actually, uh, yeah, so this, this is true gen generically when you have a larger algebra than the conformal algebra. So for example, in supersymmetric theories, um, the stress sensor is not a super primary. It's a super descendant of some other primary. But it's always a primary under the global conformal group. Yes? Can you have a central charge in dimensions other than two? Uh, can you have a central charge in dimensions other than two? Um, so uh, you... Uh, you, you don't have um, extensions of the conformal algebra that contain a central element. Um, there are things that people call central charges, but they're not really central charges. So the, the two mu never gets the extra That's right, yeah. Yeah, the extra term um, in two dimensions uh, um, also vanishes for global conformal transformations. Yes? Um, good. Uh, so the question was, um, what if you have some more, more complicated null descendant? Um, you know, P1, P2, P3, P4, O equals zero, um, which would imply some fourth order differential equation. Uh, so um, uh, in, in higher dimensions, in a unitary theory, um, uh, you cannot have those null states without having uh, one of these simpler null states. And that's equivalent to the fact that there are no u new unitarity bounds from considering higher descendants. Um, in a non-unitary theory, um, uh, this is no longer true. And then you can have a state um, that uh, such that O is non-zero, P squared O is non-zero, but P to the ninth O is zero. Um, and... Uh, uh, so you can ask, what are the correlation functions of these states? And um, I believe this is a research problem that you should work on. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, well, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So m people haven't really cared so much about them, which is why that's still a research problem. But um, non-unitary theories can show up um, in, uh, in condensed matter systems, um, certainly. Um, so uh, uh, if you have a quantum mechanical system, then it will be unitary because because quantum mechanics. But um, if your theory is uh, intrinsically Euclidean, then reflection positivity is something that it may or may not be true. It's true for the icing model um, by that that exercise I told you to check with the sum of squares. But you can write down other statistical theories um, that are, just aren't reflection positive, um, and you can also have actual statistical physical systems that aren't reflection positive. Uh, good. Um, so uh, one can also have uh, higher spin conserved currents. Um, but these are generally believed to be absent in interacting CFTs. So higher spin currents are present in free theories. The simplest example is uh, for a free boson, um, you can define a primary operator, uh, which is essentially phi with a bunch of derivatives sandwiched between them. Um, and this is a higher spin conserved current. And that's related to the fact that free theories have an infinite number of symmetries. Uh, but in, inter in an interacting theory, um, uh, you don't expect to have these. Um, and uh, there's a proof, uh, certainly for 3D CFTs. Um, and uh, is there a proof in 4D CFTs? Uh, 
Great. OK. It's being worked on. Um, probably. Sorry to put you on the spot, but okay. Yes, please, everyone, uh, everyone, discuss. Um, uh, great. Um, the the general reasoning is just that higher spin currents um, uh, are are uh, give very powerful constraints on the correlation functions, and and the hope would be that if you work out all the consequences of these constraints, you can just derive that the correlators are those of a free theory. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you. So, so in 2D, uh, uh, you absolutely have uh, higher spin currents. Um, uh, uh, so, um, so the correct analog here is um, uh, we're asking about quasi-primary states because we're just talking about the global conformal group. Um, so uh, you can look at a quasi-primary that is a Vera Soro descendant of the identity. Um, and uh, it will be a holomorphic operator and therefore conserved. So that's the simplest example. Um, uh, you can also have um, uh, more non-trivial things where you actually have a Vera Soro primary uh, that is higher spin and holomorphic. Um, and um, those lead to interesting things like W algebras and so on. Yes. Uh, the status of the trace. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean. It, 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 from the point of view of a CFT, um, it's just the zero operator because the CFT can only tell you about correlators at separated points. Um, correlators uh, at coincident points um, depend on contact terms. Um, sometimes those contact terms are fixed by symmetries. So, for example, that's the case with the word identity of the stress tensor. Um, and it's also the case with the word identity of the trace of the stress tensor with some other uh, primary. Um, but sometimes the contact terms are not fixed by symmetries, and then we expect that they're um, uh, that they're dependent on the UV regularization of the theory. Okay, I was gonna. Um, give an argument uh, about why uh, the only states in a unitary CFT are uh, linear combinations of primaries and descendants. Um, I think I want to get on to more interesting things, so I'll just sketch it really quickly. The idea is that um, uh, we now have an inner product um, that respects uh, the conformal symmetry. So you can use this inner product to project states onto different conformal multiplets. Um, so uh, basically, you can show that if you have some state and uh, you consider uh, and you project it onto all the conformal multiplets with dimension less than or equal to that state, uh, you can show that the result has to be zero. Um, and uh, uh, you can, I, to get this to work, I had to make one physical assumption, which is that the partition function of the theory um, on s d minus one cross s one is finite. Um, I'd be happy to tell you about that uh, after the lecture, but I want to get on to um, uh, to something more interesting, which actually uses that claim. So that's why I wanted to mention it. Yeah. Okay. It it's a new topic. Yeah. Yes. The claim is that all states are linear combinations of primaries and descendants. So can you 
Yes. Um, good. So should I just should I do the argument? Uh, so okay. So um, the idea is uh, so let's assume that the partition function of the theory on S d minus one cross S one with some temperature beta is finite. So this is the trace of e to the i beta d, and this is less than infinity. Okay, so um, the first thing that this implies um, is that uh, this operator, so in a unitary theory, this operator is uh, Hermitian, um, and this assumption implies that it's trace class, um, which by the spectral theorem means that this operator is diagonalizable. And so hence D is diagonalizable. Uh, with eigenvalues of this form. Um, so that's a technical thing. We're allowed to diagonalize D in a unitary theory. Um, so now let's consider some, some state O. Uh, and let's subtract from O uh, the projection um, of O onto the conformal multiplet uh, of all primary states. Um, and for simplicity, well, and let's, so let's say, so P runs over primaries uh, with dimension less than or equal to delta O. OK? So using our inner product, we can define this projector. Um, and then we subtract this off. Um, and let's call this O prime. OK? So now suppose O prime is non-zero. Um, that means that by acting with k, we can eventually get down to a primary. Right? If we didn't get down to a primary, then we'd have an infinite number of states of more and more negative dimension, and that would contradict the finiteness of this. OK, so by acting uh, on O prime with k's, we get down to a primary. But we were supposed to have subtracted off the projection um, onto all primaries with dimension less than or equal to O. Um, so that means O prime must equal 0. And this is, in practice, what you do if someone hands you an operator in a CFT. Um, you start subtracting off the components of that operator that are descendants of primaries with dimension less than it, and eventually you just get zero. Okay, so let's uh, let's stop there and. Uh, yeah, that's right. So this is the thing that fails. Um, uh, yeah, I think so. Well, not necessarily. Not not necessarily. Um, uh, let's see. In a logarithmic CFT, what you don't have is unitarity necessarily. So you don't you don't have that D is uh, is I times a Hermitian operator. So you need those two assumptions. Um, just being just being Hermitian is is uh, is um, uh, it, is not quite enough technically. I think physically, um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the theorem is that a compact Hermitian operator has a spectral decomposition. Where compact is, a, um, I mean, it's a technical condition on operators on Hilbert spaces, and this is definitely compact. Any operator that has a trace is compact. Yeah, but D, D was not, were not compact. If exponential would be compact, then it would be acknowledged. That's right. If if d is if if d is anti-Hermitian, yeah. so that that's the thing in logarithmic CFTs, d just simply oh, isn't Hermitian. You are saying that so if d were Hermitian but not compact, still I could be compact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I don't need and d to be compact. I need the exponential to be compact. I need any function of d to be compact, and then then you can get that d is diagonalizable. But the exponential is nice because it makes it compact. Yes. But then I could not infer from there that d is diagonalizable. So I start with D, which is emission, and compact, and then diagonalizable. I don't know if those exist, but you have to have D. Now I have to D will never be compact. 
So compact is basically the statement no, no, that. I, I okay. So, but suppose it's not the analyzer. Okay. It serves a thing to the technician and compact and not the analyzer. Uh, yeah, those can exist. Okay, so now I have the case of the analyzer. Um, well, then I don't know that I can do case with my assumption. Uh, you're you're running circles around me. Um. <laughs> so I start with what? E, which is not the analyzer. Yes. That's just then I exponentiate. Now it is the, the exponential is the analyzer. Yes. So how did you find all the next implication times that? Well, that now you get a contradiction. It turns out D was diagonalizable. So therefore, the assumption that D is not diagonalizable and Hermitian, <laughs> and no, no. that this is finite. No, but I think it just means that you cannot infer from an exponential to be analyzed, so that it can be analyzed. No, no, no. I think I think that's fine. So then, all admission operators can be diagonalized, which was my first. Uh, no, 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 no. You need that. The, you need that the exponential is compact. The exponential is not always compact. Oh, I thought that putting that i there was the fact to infer that. Well, it depends on how the spectrum behaves. If the spectrum is a field, that, then that is all trace. Um, yes, but now you're taking the trace. So uh, uh, the identity operator is not compact. Uh, compact basically means that, uh, that it, it squishes things more and more as you go to more and more uh, eigenvectors. But we, maybe we should talk about this offline. Yes, that's correct. Yes, that that that's absolutely right. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, I that's a great question. I don't I don't really. Uh, I don't know very much about about null quantization and how it behaves. Okay, good.